Hello everyone, in today's session we will be discussing about cerebellum and this will be an integrated session where we will be discussing about initially we will start with neuroanatomy and then we will discuss about the physiology, the connections and cerebellar syndrome. So in neuroanatomy we will be going through the external features, then the internal structure of the cerebellum and finally the functional division which is important when it comes to the physiology of cerebellum where we will be discussing about the internal connections and finally about the cerebellar syndrome or what happens when there is a problem with the cerebellum. So let's begin with the external structure of cerebellum. So as you might already know the cerebellum is located posteriorly in the cranial fossa that is in the posterior cranial fossa and where is it located? It is located behind the brainstem and the fourth ventricle. When we take a transverse section of the cerebellum we have this tree like pattern and that is known as the arborizing villi. It's a tree-like pattern which is found in the transverse section of cerebellum. Now cerebellum is divided into two halves. Here we have the superior half of cerebellum and then we have the inferior half of cerebellum. If we take the superior half of cerebellum, what we see here is that the cerebellum is divided into two halves. We have the right half and the left half and in the midline we have a structure called as the vermis in the medial part. So that's the superior surface of cerebellum. When we come to the inferior surface of the cerebellum, inferiorly we again have the left and right hemispheres but here it's a depression it's not vermis it is a depression known as the paramedian sulcus so that's the structure or the external structure of the cerebellum now we move into the other subdivisions of the cerebellum we know that cerebellum is divided into lobes and lobules because of the presence of fissures now to understand this diagram which we have here this is actually a laid out diagram of cerebellum. For example, if this is how the cerebellum looks in our previous picture, if we lay it out flat, so cerebellum has a horizontal fissure and this horizontal fissure divides the cerebellum into superior and inferior surfaces. So this is our horizontal fissure and this has divided the cerebellum into a superior part and then we have the inferior part of cerebellum. In addition to that, there are two other fissures. The first one is the primary fissure. So this is our primary fissure and the third fissure that we have is the posterolateral fissure. So the horizontal fissure as I have said it divides into superior and inferior hemisphere. What does the primary fissure do? The primary fissure divides the cerebellum into two lobes. The part that is anterior to the primary fissure is called as the anterior lobe whereas the rest of the cerebellum which is posterior to the primary fissure is called as the posterior lobe. So in this figure this one corresponds to the and primary fissure and the region that is anterior to the primary fissure corresponds to the anterior lobe whereas the rest of the cerebellum it corresponds to the posterior lobe and we have a floclonodular additional lobe as well which is actually present over here at the inferior surface of the cerebellum so that's the external feature of the cerebellum its lobes and in addition to these lobes each of these lobes contains additional lobules as well now we will discuss about the functional division of cerebellum. This is important when it comes to the physiology of cerebellum and what happens when there is a dysfunction to the cerebellum. So functionally there are two types of classification and they are two actually interrelated. So the first one is as we know in the middle part of cerebellum we have the vermis. So it is depending upon the location in the cerebellum that is there is the vermis and laterally to the vermis we have the para vermeal region lateral to the paravermeal region we have the lateral part of cerebellum or the lateral cerebellum so this is one classification the other classification is one is vestibulo cerebellum the secondly we have the spino cerebellum and the latest part that is the neo cerebellum now these three are actually kind of related in a sense the vestibulo cerebellum the part of the cerebellum which corresponds to that is this floculonodular lobe so the floculonodular lobe corresponds to the vestibular cerebellum and as we know it is concerned with the vestibular apparatus so the function of this part is to maintain the equilibrium of the body that is the main function of the vestibular cerebellum then we have the spinal cerebellum which we know as the name suggests it is related to the fibers coming from the spinal cord and the spinal cerebellum it is actually involves parts of the anterior lobe. So anterior lobe is mostly involving the spino cerebellum. The function of the anterior lobe is to maintain the posture and muscle tone. So it is related with maintaining the posture and muscle tone. And finally we have the neocerebellum. 
the neo cerebellum is only the lateral part of cerebellum the neo cerebellum is related to the posterior lobe and it is concerned with planning and coordination of movements so that's the functional division of cerebellum and we'll be coming to this topic when we discuss about the physiology with that we now move into the internal structure of cerebellum so just like the cerebrum cerebellum is composed of both gray matter and white matter but there is a difference we know that in the cerebrum in the cerebrum there is an outer cortex of gray matter and then there is an inner white matter whereas when it comes to cerebellum the gray matter is present firstly outside that is the cerebellar cortex but along with that there are parts of gray matter which is present within the white matter and they are called as the deep nuclei now the cortex is again arranged into the three layers consisting of five different cell types and the deep nuclei there are four deep nuclei so the cortex as i have mentioned it's arranged into three different layers we have an external layer we have a middle molecular layer and then we have an inner layer in the cortex we have two types of cells that is the stellate cells or the stellate neurons and then we have the basket shaped neurons or the basket cells the molecular layer which is the most important part and in the molecular layer we have the purkinje cells or the purkinje neurons in the innermost layer we have two types of cells one is going to be the golgi cells and along with that we have the granular cells so this is the structure of the cortex now what we need to understand functionally is that except for the golgi cells all the other neurons are inhibitory so stellate neuron has an inhibitory function because it releases the neurotransmitter gaba basket cells are also inhibitory the purkinje fibers are inhibitory the granular neurons are also inhibitory only golgi cells are excitatory they are the only cells which release an excitatory neurotransmitter known as glutamate whereas the other cells release GABA. Purkinje fibers projects itself into the deep nuclei. There are four deep nuclei. Laterally, we have the dentate nucleus. And since it is present laterally, as we have said earlier, it is associated with the lateral cerebellum. And then we have two nuclei. First one is the emboloiform nucleus. And then we have the globus nuclei. And this is related to the para median or the para vermeal part of cerebellum. And medially in the midline, we have the vestigial nucleus. And this vestigial nucleus, it is connected with the vestibulo cerebellum functionally. Emboliform and globus are connected functionally with the spino cerebellum and present in the para median part. The dentate, as we have said, it is related to the lateral part of cerebellum and it is connected with the neo cerebellum functionally. So that's about the deep nucleus. And all of these deep nuclei, all these deep nuclei, they are excitatory in nature. Their connections are excitatory. And it is the deep nuclei which gives out the output to the different parts, such as the red nucleus, the thalamus, reticular formation, and so on. So that's about the anatomy of cerebellum. Now we move into the physiology of cerebellum. So basically, to understand the physiology, we have this three structure. That is, we have an input. Then we have the cerebellum. And then we have the output. When it comes to the input, where does the input come from to the cerebellum? So input comes from two sources. One is the inferior cerebellar pedangle. Then we have the middle cerebellar pedangle. Now if you ask me, is the superior cerebellar pedangle involved? The answer is obviously yes. There are fibers of uh, ventral spinocerebellar tract and so on. But importantly, or most important two pedangles that are involved are the uh, inferior cerebellar pedangle and the middle cerebellar pedangle. Now what are the fibers which arise or which enter the cerebellum through this pathway. Through the middle cerebellar pedangle, we have the ponto cerebellar fibers coming from the pons. And through the inferior cerebellar pedangle, we have several important inputs. One of them is the olivo cerebellar fibers coming from the inferior olivary nucleus. Then we have obviously from the spino spinal cord, that is the spino cerebellar fibers. To be more specific, it is the dorsal spino cerebellar, the ventral spino cerebellar enters the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar pedangle then we have the cuneo cerebellar fibers and there are several other tracts which enter into the cerebellum so this is about the input now what we have to understand is that the type of fiber which enters through the olivo cerebellar or the type of fibers which carry the input into cerebellum they are classified into two types 
The first one is the fibers that come from the inferior olivary nucleus. They are actually called as the climbing fibers. Now this name arises because of the nature of these fibers and the spinocerebellar fibers are called as the mossy fibers because of their branching. So these are the two types of input fibers. We will discuss more about them when we go in detail to the connections. Now within the cerebellum what happens is that these inputs, they synapse, they activate, they excite or they inhibit the different layers in the cerebellar cortex and from these connections the cerebellar cortex either activates or inhibits our deep nuclei. So that is a connection which happens inside the intrinsic circuit of cerebellum and from the intrinsic or from the deep nuclei of cerebellum we have the outputs. The outputs mainly pass through the superior cerebellar pedangle. As I have said earlier, just like with the input, some of the outputs also pass through the inferior cerebellar pedangle and the middle cerebellar pedangle. But the most important two outputs which are concerned with the motor function are one is the output to the thalamus to be specific to the ventral anterior and ventral lateral nucleus of thalamus. And the second important output is to the red nucleus that is the cerebellorubral fibers. And these two fibers will coordinate the activity of the cerebral cortex and thereby modulate the motor function. So that is about the output or the efferent. Now this is a rough idea of how the connections move through the cerebellum. Now let's analyze deeply about the intrinsic circuit of cerebellum. That is what happens within the cere cerebellar cortex and the deep nuclei. Now let's discuss about the intrinsic circuit of cerebellum. So here we have a diagram of the cerebral cortex which we had discussed earlier, the cerebellar cortex. We have an external layer consisting of the stellate neurons. Then we have the basket cell layer. In the molecular layer we have the Purkinje neurons which are very important in the intrinsic circuit. And then we have the inner granular layer. And in the granular layer we have two types of cells. They start with G that is the Golgi cells and the granular cells. So that's about the structure of uh, cerebellar cortex. Now the important connection is that it is the Purkinje fiber which connects the cortex with the deep nucleus and we have said earlier that the Purkinje fiber is inhibitory in nature that it releases the neurotransmitter GABA. We have also mentioned that all the deep nuclei which gives out the output they are excitatory in nature. So Purkinje fibers they inhibit the excitatory output of these deep nucleus. Now where does the inputs come from? We have said earlier that the input comes from two fibers. First one we have the climbing fibers. Now what does the climbing fibers do? The climbing fibers they give rise to two connections. One is they synapse directly with the deep nucleus and the second connection is with the Purkinje fibers. Now when they synapse with the deep nucleus they release an excitatory neurotransmitter that will activate the deep nucleus and what happens the deep nucleus gives out its excitatory output and as a result movements are started that is this starts out an action whereas when these climbing fibers when they synapse with the Purkinje fibers they will activate the Purkinje fibers this Purkinje fibers will inhibit our deep nucleus and then what happens in this scenario what happens is that the deep nuclei are inhibited this happens to stop a movement so starting a movement is when the climbing fibers which arise from the olivo cerebellar tract or the olivo cerebellar fibers these fibers when they start a movement they synapse with the deep nuclei now what about the mossy fibers what do these mossy fibers do firstly where do they arise from the mossy fibers involve all the other fibers that is the spino cerebellar fibers arising from the spinal cord then we have the cuneo cerebellar fibers these are the other different inputs the vestibulo cerebellar fibers and so on they will activate the golgi neurons they will and we know that the golgi neuron is the only excitatory neuron in the cortex all the other neurons as i have said earlier are inhibitory now this golgi neuron it has connections with the basket cells and it also has connections with the stellate cells in the external layer and as i have said they will excite the basket cells and they will excite the stellate cells what do these stellate and basket cells do? Well, these cells are connected to the Purkinje cell layer and they will inhibit the Purkinje cells. So through this mechanism, what happens? Through these mechanisms, the Golgi cells can inhibit the Purkinje fibers indirectly and through this inhibition, there will be a disinhibition of the deep nuclei. 
and through this disinhibition of the deep nuclei what happens is that the deep nuclei is stimulated and then the coordination of the functions happen now what is the role of the granular cell or the granular cell what happens is that the golgi cells also has excitatory connection with the granular cell layer and this granular cell layer will in turn when they are excited by the golgi cells they will in turn inhibit the golgi cells in return so this granular cells acts as the modulator of stimulation or the modulator of activity of the golgi cells so that is in a nutshell about the cerebellar connections so we have the input in the form of climbing fibers and the mossy fibers and we have the output through the purkinje fibers the stellate and baskin cells inhibit the purkinje fibers the purkinje fibers will inhibit the deep nuclei the deep nuclei are excitatory in nature what is also important is that there is a connection between the purkinje fibers and the vestibular nuclei without involving the deep nuclei and this is involved in the vestibulo cerebellum now let's combine the knowledge of neuroanatomy and the intrinsic circuit of cerebellum which we have studied now to answer this question for the vestibulo cerebellum where does the input come from the input comes from the vestibulo cerebellar fibers and this vestibulo cerebellar fibers they are a type of mossy fibers what do the mossy fibers do inside the cerebellum inside the cerebellum they are associated with the flocculo nodular lobe in the median part of the vermeal vermis of the cerebellum and these mossy fibers we have said there is an internal circuit the output is through the vestigial nucleus that is present in the medial part of cerebellum and this is the vestigial nucleus so the output is either through the vestigial nuclei or directly to the vestibular nuclei there are direct connections to the vestibular nuclei from the purkinje cells now what is the function as we know the vestibular apparatus it is concerned with the equilibrium so this is about the vestibulo cerebellum in a nutshell what we can say is that most of the vestibular functions they happen through the middle part or the medial region of the cerebellum next up we have the spino cerebellum now where does the input come from the input comes from the spinal cord through the spino cerebellar fibers inside the cerebellum this is again a type of mossy fiber it is associated with the most parts of anterior lobe and the para medial or the para vermeal region of the cerebellum now where is the output the output is through the emboliform and the globus nuclei so these are the emboliform and the globus nuclei now what is the function the function is to maintain the posture and muscle tone so this is the main function of the spino cerebellum which means that it is mostly involved with the para medial part of cerebellum finally we have the neo cerebellum the output of input of neo cerebellum is from various sources we have the olivo cerebellar fibers there are so many uh, fibers which are involved the spino cerebellar fibers so on and inside the cerebellum it involves most parts of the posterior lobe we have both the climbing fibers and the mossy fibers are also involved in the input of neo cerebellum now where is the output the output is through the dentate nucleus and we know that the dentate nucleus is concerned with the lateral part of cerebellum so it is the lateral cerebellum and the function of this is coordination of movements and planning of highly skilled movements the cerebellum is mostly concerned with the lateral part of cerebellum so that's a nutshell of the different parts of cerebellum and how the connections go so now we have integrated the neuroanatomy with the physiology part finally let's end with the cerebellar syndrome or what happens when there is a dysfunction of cerebellum what we need to understand the first point is that the symptoms are going to be ipsilateral that is when the left cerebellum is affected the left part of body is affected and when the right cerebellum is dysfunctioning the right part of body is affected and there could be involvement of lateral part or the medial part when the lateral part is involved of cerebellum the extremities are affected that is the dentate nucleus is affected when the medial part is involved there is going to be a truncal involvement is more so what happens there could be truncal ataxia could be there the patient cannot sit down or falls while trying to sit down when the extremities are involved there is going to be dysmetria that is the calculation of movements will be lost a patient cannot grab a a thing like a patient is unable to grab a glass of water the calculation errors happens there could be dis di adeco kinesia which means that the alternate supination and pronation movements of hand is not possible so these are some of the symptoms that is the extremities are affected in the lateral cerebellum and when the medial cerebellum is dysfunction there could be truncal symptoms so now this is a code that you need to remember for the symptoms of cerebellar dysfunction and that is the code vanish v stands for vertigo a stands for ataxia ataxia is a very common symptom in all cerebellar dysfunction 
and it should be the cerebellar ataxia must be differentiated from sensory ataxia sensory ataxia is when the posterior column is involved or damaged whereas cerebellar ataxia is when the cerebellum is damaged now how do we know this the differentiating point is by the romberg sign what happens is that in sensory ataxia ataxia occurs when the eyes are closed whereas in a cerebellar ataxia there is ataxia even with the eyes open so when you have ataxia even when the eyes are open that is cerebellar ataxia now n stands for nystagmus vertigo and nystagmus they are actually due to the involvement of the vestibulo cerebellum so damage to the floccular nodular lobe can give rise to vertigo nystagmus ataxia happens in damage to any part of the cerebellum then the important one which is very very important and that is indention tremor now there is another type of tremor that is known as resting tremor when tremor occurs when a patient is at rest it is a sign of parkinsonism that is basal ganglia is involved whereas indention tremor is when a patient is intending to do an activity so tremor happening when a patient intends to do activity is called as indention tremor and this should be differentiated from resting tremor which occurs during rest and s stands for slurred speech why is there slurred speech or in other words there could be dysarthria it is because of lack of coordination of tongue muscles and we have said that the spino cerebellum controls the tone of muscles so in cerebellar disorders there is hypotonia so that is what the h stands for now e stands for exaggerated broad based gait that is the patient will have a very wide gait this is because when the patient tries to put his feet close together he will fall down due to ataxia therefore he will adopt a very wide based gait and finally the d stands for dysmetria this involves dys diadecokinesia as well that is there is difficulty to do alternating supination and pronation that is the patient is unable to do alternate supination and pronation this is also the basis for the finger nose test which we learn in physiology so in a nutshell that is about the neuroanatomy of cerebellum the physiology of cerebellum and the symptoms which happen when there is a disorder of